That's not a guy. <laughs> so now we're going to talk about transport mechanisms in the nephron. And we're going to start with the proximal tubule, which we'll abbreviate PT. We can see we have a cell drawn here. And the thing about the nephron cells is that there's a apical side that faces the tubular fluid and there's a basolateral side that faces the blood. These are polarized cells, which means that the two sides look very different from one another. So let's take a look at first the sodium potassium ATPase pump, which sets up a low concentration of sodium on the inside, as well as a high potassium concentration. And we can see that we have several transporters mechanisms listed here, and we'll start first with the one that's labeled SGLT2, sodium glucose co-transporter type 2. This is the predominant one that's responsible for glucose reabsorption in the proximal tubule. And you can see that it's a co-transporter that requires the sodium gradient that's set up by the sodium potassium ATPase pump. We have other co-transporters, sodium amino acid co-transporter, sodium phosphate co-transporters, and we also have constitutively present water channels that allow water to be reabsorbed. Now on the basolateral side, we're just gonna unname these transport mechanisms. It's not really all that important to know their names. Probably the most important transporter on the apical side here is this SGLT2 because it is a target of a very important class of drugs to treat diabetes mellitus. We have another proximal tubule cell, and you see that there's some junctions in between here that we can have more water and calcium and other ions go through. That's characteristic of the proximal tubule. And we can see here that we have room now to put in some other mechanisms, mechanisms of reabsorbing bicarbonate. Now we filter bicarbonate at the glomerulus, and it turns out that we need to reabsorb quite a bit of this bicarbonate, and a lot of it is done here through this mechanism that's shown using this sodium hydrogen exchanger. So we can see that we have hydrogen ions being secreted, sodium again using the sodium gradient, and this proton gets together with the bicarbonate and forms carbonic acid, H2CO3. There's an enzyme called carbonic anhydrase, abbreviated here CA, that causes you to form uh, carbon dioxide gas and water the water can just get reabsorbed, and because CO2 is a gas, it can diffuse into the cell where there is some water, and the carbonic anhydrase inside the cell can then convert back to carbonic acid, which then dissociates into a proton, which can be then reutilized by the NHE and formed a bicarbonate, which it can then just go outside the back basolateral side. This is a mechanism of getting filtered bicarbonate that was in the tubular fluid and into the blood. It doesn't happen directly. You have to go through this pathway to get the bicarbonate to then go out again on the basolateral side. We also have some secretory transport mechanisms illustrated here on the basolateral side. We have organic cation transporters that transport cations. This could be drugs. It could be creatinine. Also, we have organic anion transporters that transports anions such as paramino hyperic acid or PAH, and also anionic drugs. And then these can eventually get secreted into the tubular fluid and then excreted in the urine. So now we're gonna talk about the thick ascending limb, which is the final portion of the loop of Henle. We didn't spend time talking about the thin descending limb, which just reabsorbs water passively and the thin ascending limb, which is only really seen in the long loop juxtamedullary nephrons, which reabsorbs passively sodium and chloride as well. So we look at the polarized cell here, and we have the apical membrane on this side, the basolateral on that side. And if we look first on this apical side at the transporter NKCC2, which is facing the tubular fluid here, that's the sodium two chloride potassium triple co-transporter. As these ions come in in electroneutral fashion, that is two cations and two anions, they are gonna be reabsorbed back into the blood through the backside. Transporters are not shown. 
but there's also a channel here on the apical membrane called ROMK. This stands for renal outer medullary potassium channel. And this does a little tiny bit of potassium secretion that this cycles around, but as it does that, it creates a small positive lumen potential and that positive charge repels cations, primarily these divalent cations, which are really repelled by it, like calcium and magnesium, but also sodium and potassium can get reabsorbed in between the cells, and we call that paracellular reabsorption. So it's very important to see the connection between the activity of NKCC2, this back leak of potassium, and this reabsorption of these ions in between cells. And this will be very relevant when we talk about drugs that block the NKCC2 and the impact it has on calcium magnesium reabsorption. If we look at the distal tubule, that would be, again, we have the polarized cell and we have the apical side facing the tubular fluid, the basal lateral side facing the blood. There's the sodium potassium ATPase pump again, which creates the gradients for sodium and potassium. And we see here on the apical side, we have the NCC, that's the sodium chloride co-transporter, goes down the gradient for sodium, which is created by the sodium potassium pump. Chloride follows suit. They can be reabsorbed on the basal lateral side. And also shown here is that there is a, another channel on the apical side. We talked about the ROMK, ROMK potassium channel on the thick ascending limb. We have also this TRIP V5 channel, which is the transient receptor potential channel five. This is a calcium channel. And calcium goes through transcellularly and then can be reabsorbed on the back side. The reason why this channel is important is that it's regulated by the hormone parathyroid hormone or PTH which binds to PTH receptors on the basolateral side coupled to GS, increases cyclic AMP and PKA, and then that can help activate this channel and allow calcium to be reabsorbed. And one of the important effects of parathyroid hormone is that it helps increase the free ionized calcium levels in the blood, and it does so in part by increasing the reabsorption of calcium from the distal tubule. So now we finally have the collecting duct here. So we have two cell types, the principal and the type A intercalated cells. And we have the apical side facing the tubular fluid over here. We have the basolateral facing the blood, our sodium potassium ATPase pump as usual, setting up the sodium potassium gradients. And now what we see here is there's a channel. There's a sodium channel. It's a epithelial sodium channel. It's called ENAC and sodium goes alone. And what that does is it creates a, a electrical charge because it's electrogenic by taking a cation by itself. And that creates a negative lumen potential. The negative lumen potential creates favorable secretion of cations or charged species here. Potassium is going to go through ROMK. It's going to like that negative charge. So when you reabsorb more sodium, you can get more potassium secretion. And also the alpha intercalated cells also can promote more hydrogen ions being secreted. Also I want to point out that there's water channels. These are special ones. These are aquaporin-2 that are inserted in the membrane from vesicle storage. And that process of water reabsorption is regulated by the posterior pituitary hormone antidiuretic hormone or vasopressin which binds to its seven transmembrane spanning receptor, it's called the V2 receptor, which is coupled to GS, increases cyclic AMP and protein kinase A activity, which promotes the insertion of these aquaporin channels and promotes water reabsorption. Also importantly, that there's receptors for all the steroid hormone aldosterone, which comes from the adrenal cortex, specifically the zona glomerulosa layer. And here it's just showing that there's an intracellular receptor the mineralocorticoid receptor, which is a sitting here showing as a schematic where it would go and ultimately go into the nucleus and regulate gene transcription. And this receptor activation leads to several things inside the cell. A couple of examples are it could increase ENAC insertion into the membrane, so it promotes sodium reabsorption and also promotes sodium potassium ATPase pump activity, which helps promote, again, sodium reabsorption by enhancing the, the gradient, but also by reabsorbing more sodium, you're gonna get more potassium and more hydrogen ion secretion as well. So aldosterone doesn't just regulate sodium reabsorption, it also regulates potassium levels and arterial pH. 
So there's also the, this importance of the collecting duct reabsorption through ENAC on potassium and hydrogen secretion, as we mentioned earlier. If you're reabsorbing more sodium through ENAC, and that, just for example, could be through increased delivery of sodium to the collecting duct. So if there was something upstream blocked in terms of reabsorption, you could end up with more sodium delivered. That's just one way that can occur. Or you can have more mineralocorticoid receptor activity that, again, regulates ENAC and the sodium-potassium pump. You get more of a negative charge, more potassium hydrogen secretion, and less potassium in the blood because you're excreting more of it, and also an alkali, alkalized pH because you're getting rid of protons and also reabsorbing bicarbonate. The opposite is true if you decrease reabsorption through ENAC Either there's less sodium delivery to the collecting duct, or if there's decreased mineralocorticoid receptor activity, this could be because there's less aldosterone. There's less aldosterone because you're not making it from the adrenal cortex, for example, or you block the receptor. Those are just be examples of reducing sodium reabsorption. In that case, you have less negative charge buildup, less secretion, and you have an increase in plasma potassium and an acidic arterial or plasma pH because you are not getting rid of protons and not reabsorbing bicarbonate.